Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash from Warrior Ministries, coming to you on RTN TV Scotland. It's been suggested that we clarify an issue that some Christians are confused concerning. That is what we call the five another's, the five another's, A-N-O-T-H-E-R-S. <clears throat> and related to this, the question of what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin. Now, we've talked about this before because there have been so many Christians that we've all met who think or believe they did it when they haven't. Uh, and we've addressed this before, but we'll go through it again, defining what it is, and then we'll look at the five another's, the five another's. When we speak out, against another ministry, another minister, another church, another whatever. When do we speak out the five another's? Let's look. <clears throat> this subject of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin, occurs in all three synoptic gospels. It's in Luke chapter 12, it's in Mark chapter 3, but let's look at the most elaborate presentation of what it is, found in Matthew's Gospel chapter 12. Matthew's Gospel chapter 12, please. We'll begin in verse 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. Now, this was a case where a physical malady was indeed caused by something demonic. Physical maladies are not all as a direct result of some kind of demonic possession. This is the case it was. All the crowds were amazed, and they were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? Meaning the Messiah. <clears throat> But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, that is a metaphor for the devil. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. A line borrowed by Abraham Lincoln in his address concerning the partition of the United States over the issue of slavery. It became known for that, but it comes directly from the Gospels. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. <clears throat> he who was not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. What is this in context? Let's understand what it is and what it is not. As we've said before, there are many sincere Christians who Satan has tormented spiritually and emotionally into thinking they committed this unpardonable sin. In a moment of weakness, confusion, during trials, they said something concerning the Holy Spirit they wish they hadn't, and now live in condemnation and continual demonic oppression sometimes. 
This is a horrible thing, a horrible thing. But that's not what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit actually is. To blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is something quite different. What is it? Let's understand something. Cognizantly and with calculation, knowing that Jesus was from God, possibly the Messiah, knowing what he was doing was of God and from God, they deliberately attributed it to Satan. What the Holy Spirit was doing through Jesus, they were attributing to another spirit of a demonic origin. That's what they were doing. In fact, they were doing it in the name of Satan himself. They were saying it was Satan. They were putting Satan in place of the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit was doing, they were saying Satan is doing. Their motive? with calculation and cognizance, knowing what they were doing, knowing Jesus was from God, knowing that what he was doing and teaching <coughs> was ordained of God by the Holy Spirit, attributed it to Satan in order to mislead others away from Christ, in order to mislead others away from the truth in order to mislead others away from the way of salvation. Cognizantly, and with calculation, knowing it was the Holy Spirit working through Jesus at this time, they attributed what the Holy Spirit was doing to Satan in order to deceive and mislead other people, seeking people, honest people. In this context, it would have been the Amha'adats, the ordinary people. The religious establishment was up against their own Messiah, wanting to keep power for their own self-aggrandizing interests theocratically and financially. They were accusing Jesus of performing these acts in the power of Satan, knowing he was from God. There are those, such as Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who say, who write, who teach, who believe, that it's not possible for this sin to happen now. It was only possible for it to happen on the other side of Pentecost among the Jews. He has that view. Others share that view, that it's not possible to even happen now. <coughs> I do not fully agree with them, although I do understand they have a point. I partially agree with them, but not fully. I cannot write out the possibility of it happening now. But look what it involves. With calculation, with cognizance, knowing it was of the Holy Spirit, attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the satanic in order to mislead the people of God or the children of God or other people seeking the truth. This is the unpardonable sin. It's not something that anyone can do. It's not something that can be done easily. Now, there are those who've said ridiculous things. There are word faith money preachers who say, if you speak against their mammon worship and their ministry, that you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They actually said this, some of them. I have been accused of blaspheming the Holy Spirit twice. The first is when I said, and a few others with me, I was not the only one, but I was one of them, who said the laughing and drunking phenomena from Toronto and then Pensacola 
was not a true revival. It did not meet the biblical or historical patterns and standards of revival. The Holy Spirit has his fruit, ikete, self-control. When you see people out of control like this, that's not God's spirit. You know them by their fruits. I said things like animal imitations and people were actually barking like dogs and all sorts of things that the mind of a beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar. If it's God, he's angry. And various things like this. I opposed these counterfeit revivals. I said most of it was carnal and some of it was demonic. I said that. And I was accused by a number of pastors who were promoting the laughing, drunken counterfeit revival of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That would mean that I, knowing that Toronto and Pensacola was from God, was really a work of the Holy Spirit, that, that it was right that all these phenomena happening were right. And knowing it was right and knowing it was a real revival, I misled people away from what God was doing in order to serve my own interests. Well, here we are a number of years later and no revival came from that display of carnality and some of it almost insanity, but certainly it was based on a lot of false doctrine. The fruit of the spirit is self-control. The things they were teaching, much of it was just lunatic. They were twisting Bible verses out of all order even. This was the refreshing before the revival, before the repentance. We don't see people getting saved and repenting because the refreshing comes first. Quoting from the book of Acts? No, misquoting from the book of Acts. The book of Acts says, first the repentance comes, then the refreshing comes. But because I pointed that out and things like it, they said I was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I wasn't the only one they said it about, but they certainly said it about me. That was once. Now there's someone else saying it, someone who was, shall we say, liberal with the truth. He lies. Stuart Menlaw says that because I disagree, I oppose the so-called ministry of his wife, that I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That means I cognizantly, cognizantly, and with calculation, know that what she's doing is of the Holy Spirit, and I'm saying it's of the devil in order to mislead people away from what God is doing. That's what he accuses me of. Now, remember, it requires cognizance and calculation. It requires ascribing to Satan that which is of God, knowing you're doing that with the deliberate intent of misleading others. There is a debate to be had whether it can happen now or not, but that is another debate. <clears throat> Let's look at this. John MacArthur is a radical cessationist. He and R.C. Sproul a few years ago had a terrible conference at his church that was essentially there to attempt to demolish any belief in continuationism. That is the belief that the gifts of the Spirit, the charismatic gifts, continue from the time of the apostles, that tongues, prophecy, miracles, and things did not cease with the apostles. He had not always been so radical about it in previous years. He'd been friendly to people like Chuck Smith, who he condemned at the conference, but they'd been friends when Chuck was alive. He said some terrible things about some sincere Christians, and he said some really bad things about practicing the gifts of the Spirit. <coughs> now, as you generally know, I'm opposed to charismania, to neo-Montanism. I oppose the counterfeit revivals of Toronto and Pensacola as not being real, not being authentic. 
I oppose the word faith money preachers, but I do not throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. I'm a continuationist. I believe that these gifts can and do continue and will continue until the parousia, the return of Christ. Now, if you want to say much of what we see is counterfeit and not real, I certainly agree. But I don't toss the real out because of the counterfeit any more than I would burn money because there's counterfeit money. It's just silly. That is the mentality, however, to which Mr. MacArthur appears to subscribe. He denounces the gifts of the Spirit. He denounces churches that practice it. He denounces preachers who teach it, authors who write about it. They were all universally denounced in no uncertain terms by him in his church in California at his conference. Do I think that John MacArthur blasphemed the Holy Spirit? No, I do not. I think he taught error. I think he's deceived. I think he's misled and he is misleading others. On this point and various other points, I believe he is misled, deceived. I think he's teaching error. But not for one moment, not for one second do I believe that he is deliberately and intentionally, with cognizance and calculation, ascribing to Satan things that he knows to be of God in order to mislead the body of Christ. He is not doing that. Is he misled? Yes. Is he misleading people? Unfortunately, yes. But is there a malicious cognizance? Is there a calculated effort, an orchestrated effort to do this? <clears throat> no. He's not trying to attribute to Satan something he knows is of God in order to mislead people. Now, what he's doing in teaching is wrong, but he hasn't blasphemed the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I'm not making light of his error, but that's not the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin requires cognizance and calculation. You must know that that is a work of the Holy Spirit. You must know that it's Jesus who's in it. You must know that. And you must, with intent, with nefarious intent, attribute that which God is doing to Satan. Ascribe to a demon or to Satan that which the Holy Spirit is doing knowingly, with the deliberate intention to mislead other people. Not easily done, thankfully, but it has been done. And some would say it is still done. Again, that's a separate issue. Well, Disagreeing with the Toronto experience, honestly believing it was not a real revival, honestly believing the doctrinal basis upon which these practices were taking place were not of God, is not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't question there may be, had been sincere people who were seeking the Lord in it. But when sincere people who have the Holy Spirit see things that are contrary to Scripture, they'll stop going with it. The Holy Spirit will show them. And some of those phenomena with Toronto are absolutely shocking and disgusting. Uh, some people tried to say, well, you're judging the whole movement by its excesses, by its fringe element or, or excesses. No, the main leaders... John Arnott and Rodney Howard Brown and Randy Clark, the main leaders of it, and Stacey Campbell, they were propagating the false doctrine, and they were orchestrating the bizarre practices. 
It's what Paul said in Corinthians. If the unsaved enter and see this, will they not say you are mad? Before that, I was called blaspheming the Holy Spirit. They said that I knew this was of God, and I was telling people it wasn't deliberately for my own self-serving ends. That's what it is. And now I'm being told by a man who, frankly, he, he does not tell the truth. He just lies in his convenience. That because I disagree and disapprove of what his wife does in certain respects, that I say her ministry is wrong, therefore I have committed the unpardonable sin. Well, let's understand this. The unpardonable sin. I would have to know something is of God and be deliberately out to mislead people, saying what God is doing is of Satan. With probably premeditation, certainly with calculation and cognizance. That's what he's saying. And he said things that are just, I don't even want to get into it. I mean, look, I've got lymphatic edema since 2015. I look like a watermelon head sometimes. My chest builds up. I have to pump fluid out of my legs every morning. Okay, lymphatic fluid with a pump. I put on leggings and the pumps. I have to walk with this horrible thing. Yes, I've gained weight, and the distribution anywhere there's lymphatic tissue makes me look heavy. On the Men Law's website, they posted something that they said someone or some woman sent them or wrote. They say they came from someone that I'm like a, a monkey who needs a bra. <laughs> Now, I think that's just stupid, silly. If you're going to debate me doctrinally or theologically, do so. The personal insults are not necessary. Someone concerning Deborah Menlos, I have no idea who it was. It was not me, certainly, and it was no one in Moriel, no one that I know of. A lot of people dislike her put something on the internet and they called her something like a smelly mutant tuna with AIDS. <laughs> now, I didn't write that. I didn't say that. The men laws blamed Moriel for it and put it up on their own website. And people saw it and circulated it. And we responded to it. We said, we didn't say this. I don't engage in that kind of silliness. I leave that to people like Menlaws. I don't engage in that nonsense. We don't put that stuff on our own website. Uh, we responded to them saying it was us on our website, but we didn't do it. I, Before the Lord, I do not know who wrote that. And frankly, neither do I care. Smelly mutant tuna with AIDS. And, uh, to me, that's just, <laughs> let's deal with the issues. The personal insults of a childish nature are stupid. I know that she was very ill, as I was very ill, and she underwent emergency surgical procedures, and it's affected her appearance. Bad health does that to people. I don't mock her for that. But let's deal with the issues. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. No, that's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When do we actually have a mandate to speak out about another ministry and say it is not of God? Now, remember, what we always talk about is parasogzusin in 2 Peter chapter 2. False teachers and false prophets always juxtapose truth next to error. They always disguise error with truth. They package error in truth. In fact, it's a small amount of poison, but a deadly amount of poison packaged in things that are true. Parasoxusin. They secretly introduce it, Peter says. Great description. Jesus said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he warned, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, false doctrine. Now, I don't think 
somebody who places the rapture at a different point than I do. I don't think that pre-tribulationists are heretics. I think some of them are extreme. I think some of them are not being fair in the way they handle the scripture, but I don't think it makes you a heretic. I just think they're misguided. I don't think cessationists are false brethren. I think they're misguided when they say the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles. I think that they are in doctrinal error in that respect, but I don't say that they're not Christians. I don't say that they're not saved. I'm premillennial, very strongly premillennial. One of my favorite preachers of the 20th century, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, was not. An issue for discussion? Yes. An issue for division? No. Well, where do we draw the line then? Where do we stand up and say some ministry or some so-called Bible teacher or televangelist, where do we stand up and say what they're doing is not of God? This comes down to the five another's, the five another's. The first of the five another's is obviously another God. We call this idolatry. Anything that lends credence to another God, we draw the line. When I see people like Brian Houston from Hillsong and others propagating the false teaching that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same God as the Nabataean moon God of the Muslims known as Allah, there's a problem. Allah is not Elohim. Now, there's a linguistic issue surrounding this in the Arabic and so forth. Allah is not Elohim. They don't have the same God as us. No, they do not. One example. You see people involved in interfaith worship, and you see people involved in the ecumenical movement. As I've often said, okay, you get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama or with Hindu Brahmins. There's only one God. Anything that in any way, to any degree, compromises with a God other than the one true God, we draw the line. They are not of God. Brian Houston, for that reason alone, you are not of God. But let's continue. That's the first another. The second another is one that we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, something I've mentioned many times. The pseudo-logos, or the pseudo-logon. Jesus is the logos. Jesus is the scripture incarnate. The scripture, as we always say, is Jesus in print. He's the logos. Now, a pseudo-logon could be written. That's called a pseudographo. <clears throat> Things like the Book of Mormon, papal encyclicals, the Koran. These are pseudo-logons. They have no basis as doctrinal authority. But it doesn't have to be written. It can be spoken as it says in Timothy. When you see people say, God told me this and the Lord showed me that, and they make a doctrine out of it without any scriptural foundation, 
without any exegetical basis in scripture, and they proclaim it to be doctrinal, look out. But there are even people who invent doctrines this way. I've seen it. They've invented doctrines based on God showed me. Now, of course, that's something that relates strongly to Gnosticism, but it is a pseudo-logos, a false word of God. When you see somebody doing that, when you see some basis or some pretended basis for doctrine, other than the scriptures, we draw the line. Don't tell me what God showed you. Show me what God said in his word. Now, if you say with what God showed you lines up with what's in his word, I'll listen to you. But the word is the basis by which I evaluate all other revelation. There's no new doctrinal revelation. There's no other doctrine except what's in scripture. We draw the line. Jesus condemned this. In, Ma in Matthew 15, Roman Catholicism, as one example, as I've said many times, can only exist by doing what Jesus condemned the Pharisees to hell for, teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men, papal encyclicals. Pick up the New Testament. Find me purgatory, find me scapulas, find me mass cards. Um, they must teach as precepts of God the inventions of men. These papal encyclicals, these catechisms, catechetical literature, to which they ascribe doctrinal authority, the pseudorogon, the Talmudic writings of the rabbis, a pseudorogon. The Koran is Sudorogan. Book of Mormon, Sudorogan. The Watchtowers and Awake magazine, Sudorogan. There's no basis for authority doctrinally other than the scripture. But then we get to the triple crown, the three big anothers. Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11. <coughs> Paul writes... In verse 2, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin, using the analogy of holy matrimony, the church being the bride of Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. A different Jesus, a different Christ, a different spirit and a different gospel. Again, we know that the spirit brother of Satan, the Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints of Mormonism, is another Jesus. It's a different one. We know the Eucharistic Christ of Rome is another Jesus. He's not bread and wine. He says he will return physically the way he left. Mother Jesus, the Isa of Islam, a prophet inferior to Muhammad, is not the real G. It's another Jesus. 
the cosmic Christ of the New Ages, Matria, is another Jesus. Another Jesus, another Jesus, another Jesus, another Jesus. Doreen Virtue and Chris Roseborough have this apparition that she had a painting made of, and he has a statue of. He said, she said Jesus comes to her and appeared to her, not in a vision from heaven, but as an apparition on earth, and he was not crucified. Now, when he comes back, in the book of Zechariah, we are told, they'll look upon me who they have pierced. In Revelation chapter 1, when he comes back, he's pierced. The Jesus of Rosebro and of Doreen Virtue was a different Jesus. He wasn't crucified, and he didn't come back to the Mount of Olives. He came back in a statue or a picture or something, or what they claim to be an apparition. There are no apparitions of Christ. There may be visions, but he's in heaven, and those are rare. He doesn't come back to this earth. Jesus warned, if anyone says he's in the wilderness, don't go there. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. The Son of Man is coming back the way he left. So the last thing we're told when he ascended in Acts chapter 1. No, another Christ. Many people have another Christ. Many. When you see an evangelical Christian, supposedly, whatever that means these days, is now debatable. But someone professing to be born again, thinking it is okay to have the Roman Catholic Eucharist, that's lending credence to another Christ. It's another Christ. A Jesus who was not crucified, that's another Christ. Muslims say that the Koran speaks about Jesus more than it speaks about Mohammed. That's true, it does. Except everything it says about him contradicts the New Testament. It says he's not the son of God. It says he did not die on the cross, Judas did. It says he's not the Messiah, that Mohammed is the great prophet. Well, it talks a lot about Jesus in order to persuade people that what the New Testament and gospel say about him isn't true. The whole a different Jesus. Once you see someone compromising with a different Jesus in any way, we draw the line. They are false. But then there's a different spirit. We have the fruit of the spirit in Galatians. And we have the sevenfold spirit of God that Jesus cites from the Septuagint version of Isaiah. The two main features of the Holy Spirit, however, for believers in the teaching of Jesus are this. One, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness, of moral living. Why do people's lives change when they get saved? Why do they stop substance abuse or stop fornicating? Why do they stop gambling? And because of the Holy Spirit. The old creation is dead, and the Holy Spirit empowers them to live a moral life, a holy life. When you see people with a different spirit, the first thing you're going to see is a lack of holiness. You see these people running around with no scriptural reason getting divorced and remarried as Christians. As Christians getting divorced and remarried, according to the New Testament, they're in adulterous remarriages. One of Menlo's main henchwomen is this. This is not the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of holiness. A wife is joined to her husband as long as he lives. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. I hate divorce, saith the Lord. If you got the Holy Spirit, 
He's going to empower you to live that way through whatever difficulties or strains a marriage may have. The marriage is not based on human love. It's based on God's love. Where you have a different spirit, you're going to see some kind of a breakdown of morality, of holiness, of people doing things that the scripture says not to. But the other is he's the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth. Where you have another spirit being preached in the church, you will have doctrinal error, possibly leading to the spirit of error. These things you see going on today with evangelicals compromising with homosexuality and same-sex marriage, Oh, my Lord. There are certain things about the men laws, people that they've featured on their own website that are demonstrably homosexual activists into homosexual pornography, and we can prove it. At the appropriate time, we will. But let's look. Another spirit. Then we have another gospel. Here is why I stood opposed to the men laws and to Deborah men laws. Another gospel. Look with me, please, to the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 7. I'm amazed you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for another gospel. Oh, it's really not another gospel. Only there are some who or disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Now let's look at what the Word of God tells us about the true gospel. Look with me, please, to the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 4. We read the following. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you've not desired, but a body you've prepared for me. The body of Jesus was going to be crucified in our place. These Old Testament animal sacrifices were mere shadows of the Messiah, according to Hebrews. The blood of animals can never take away sin. We also read the following. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. But now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And now, and now nays, once again, look at verse 20, the blood of the eternal covenant. Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 14, verse 4.
These are the ones who've not been defiled with women, but have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased as the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in them. Okay. It continues, and I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel. Eternal. Hebrews, eternal, everlasting. It doesn't end. Now, the age of grace will end, but the gospel does not end. People will only ever be saved by the blood of Jesus. Any return to animal sacrifices in the millennium will be like the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they taught about what the Messiah would do, and in a virtually almost sinless world, it's going to be a way in the millennium to teach what he did do, but they cannot take away sin. The blood of animals can never take away sin. That is another gospel. The idea or the notion or the heretical teaching that his blood will not continue to avail in propitiation, and then the blood of animals will come in and replace it? Watch this video clip promoted and defended by Deborah and Stuart Menlaws, another gospel. Watch it. There will come a time where the grace of God comes to an end. For the Gentile mind, this is difficult to conceive. Because you, were, you have been grown, you've been brought up in a church culture that says that the blood of Jesus Christ is eternal to save mankind for eternity. It's not a biblical concept. It's a Gentile concept. It's not biblical. The blood of Christ will save until the end of the dispensation of grace. When the age of grace comes to an end, the blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything. Now I know right there I heard tilt. The epistle to the Hebrews teaches the diametric opposite of what he does. The diametric opposite. He goes on to say in the millennium, the blood of animals will remove sin. But that is not the only time men laws has promoted and defended and given platform to somebody who preaches a different gospel. Take a look at this gentleman. <clears throat> there he is with his statue. We have photos of him praying in front of this statue of an uncrucified Jesus. This man, noted for a number of things, including the profanity found on a blog site put out by his producer, who is his son and partner, has another gospel. Our gospel says we have a high priest who is Jesus, that he alone has the authority to forgive sin. Now, in leading someone to Christ, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. We can say that. But the idea that as a Christian, if you want your sins forgiven, you have to go to this man who prays in front of the statue of an uncrucified Christ, who among other things, in addition to his sickeningly vulgar profanity that he goes along with, teaches there's no antichrist, no falling away, no mark of the beast, 
He denies all these things, which Menelaus claims to believe. And she promotes this guy, despite the profanity, despite the bisexual scandals concerning his church and so forth. Despite all these things, Menelaus defends and promoted Rosebro. Rosebro teaches there's a clergy class. The scripture says there's a priesthood of all believers, but he teaches in addition to that, or despite that, there is a clergy class of which he is a member. And because he has taken a vow to God, God has given him the authority to forgive your sins. If you want your sins forgiven, you must go to Rosebro, kneel down, and tell Mr. Rosebro your sins. That's how your sins will be forgiven. His religious vow as a clergyman gives him the power that when you kneel down and tell him your sins, he can forgive you in the name of Christ or something. This is another gospel. That is not how sin is forgiven. We are told we confess our sin to the Lord. He is right and just to forgive. Rosebro's blood was not shed for our sin, and either was Menlaw's. No, this is another gospel. They did it with David Nathan, and they did it with the Reverend Rosebro. It's a different gospel. It is irrelevant how many other things she may have said that were true, which is in itself, in the opinion of many people, debatable. But even if it was all true, once you go to another gospel, it all gets thrown into the trash where it belongs. Another God, another word of God, another Christ, another spirit, another gospel. There are five another's. Once somebody gives any place, any defense, any promotion, lends any credence to even one of those another's, they are not the servants of the Lord. They are people to be avoided. Those who proclaim a different gospel are anathema, it says, accursed of God. That's what God says, they're accursed. That's what Paul writes, accursed. It's very serious. To live and die accursed of God? No. Men laws can put all of Rosebro's junk they want on their websites or blog sites. It's another gospel. Kneeling down and telling him your sins is not going to get them forgiven. No, the gospel of Jesus is eternal. His blood is eternal. Contrary to the teaching of David Nathan, the blood of these animals will never take away sin. Yet Menelaus defended and promoted both of these propagators of a different gospel. Therefore, I warn the body of Christ, they are not of God. Make of it what you will. If you think that that makes me a blasphemer of the Holy Spirit, you've got a problem. You don't know what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. 
and either the Stuart Manilaws, to ascribe to a demon, a devil, that which you know is of God in order to mislead people? That is unforgivable. But to be an anathema? To be a curse of God? That's dangerous living. And to promote it and to defend it, that's dangerous living. That is why I warn against the Manilaws. Finally, and this is about the 10th or 12th time I've said this. They say I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Look at me. If I did that, why are you still selling people commercially video films featuring me and making money on me if I am what you say? You are a hypocrite and a liar. These are the realities. Now, look, I don't want to give these people attention. I've said enough. I've told you the truth. Don't believe that you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. If it bothers you, if it troubles you, that in itself is a very strong indication that you didn't do it. People who do that don't care that they did it. The very fact that it bothers you, that Satan is using it to torment you, that in itself practically exonerates you and demonstrates your innocence. That's not what it is. That's not what it means. It's not it. I don't argue every doctrinal point. I disagree with certain things. I agree with other things. Yes, I am premillennial. Yes, you know, I believe in believer's baptism. Yes, you know, I have the view that the rapture will not happen until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. Yes, I have my doctrinal positions. But I don't condemn other Christians who don't share them. But if it's another God? Or compromise with another God? If it's another word of God? Or compromise with another word of God? if it's another Christ, or compromise with another Christ, an antichrist, or if it's another spirit, or compromise with another spirit, or if it's another gospel, and compromising with another gospel. God draws the line. So do I. And if you believe in God, according to his word, so will you. My name is James Jacob Prash from Moriel Ministries, coming to you on RTN TV Scotland. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back this week looking at our teaching on the book of Joel, and we will be looking at Word for the Weekend Saturday night. Thank you so much. God bless. Mm -hmm.